Welcome to the North Carolina College Resuscitation. I'm Jamie Jollis. I'm a cardiologist at Duke University. Along with thousands of colleagues in North Carolina, we're all working to improve emergency cardiac care. I'm Chris Granger. I'm a cardiologist at Duke University. And I'd like to welcome you to this series of presentations on a very important project for the state of North Carolina. That is the Heart Rescue Project, or Race Cars. And this is the project to improve survival for patients with cardiac arrest by 50% over five years in the state of North Carolina. And it has a series of proven interventions that, that we need your help with that include interventions in the community to increase rates of bystander CPR and to educate the public to activate the EMS system when a cardiac arrest is, is identified. It, it involves the best practices by emergency medical services, um, including rapid application of defibrillation and best care in transportation and destination to the best centers able to care for patients with cardiac arrest, and then hospital measures that include primary PCI when that's indicated, therapeutic hypothermia, uh, and best care for patients with cardiac arrest during their hospital phase, including consideration for implantable defibrillators. And by doing all of these things, um, we believe that we can be very successful in improving survival for patients with cardiac arrest. This next module um, discusses an unsuccessful resuscitation. Remember, I didn't say fail, just unsuccessful. A couple objectives for this module. We're going to review the key 2010 AHA updates. Uh, we're going to discuss an on-scene approach to managing a cardiac arrest, um, discuss what happens after an unsuccessful resuscitation, discuss grief response from survivors, um, discuss a framework uh, of acute grief treatment, and review the techniques in dealing with survivor grief. We'll also discuss provider stress, reaction, and response to that stress. In the 2010 update, we noticed one key element that has been pervasive throughout that update, and what's the main ingredient for successful resuscitation? That is high quality, continuous, and uninterrupted chest compress compressions and the early use of AEDs. Can we affect high quality compressions with multiple patient moves? No, every move interrupts our compressions and de decreases our compression fraction. Can we affect high quality compressions during transport? Very difficult to perform high quality compressions. It's dangerous to the crew. It's also dangerous to the public. So why don't we transport CPR? It's because we've always done it. One of the main questions you need to ask yourself or ask of your agency, is there anything that my local hospital or regional medical center has to provide in a cardiac arrest that I don't have access to? In the vast majority of North Carolina, that answer is no. We have everything that we need available to us to carry out in a typical cardiac resuscitation. Dogma, it's what we always done. There's a pressure to limit scene times. There's a pressure to transport all patients. And there's a perception that the emergency department has more treatment options available. There's a public expectation to transport. But I would argue the main reason we don't transport, because it's a very effective way to limit your exposure to survivor grief. Is there a better way? Many agencies in North Carolina are adopting on-scene approach to cardiac arrest and termination of that resuscitation if it's unsuccessful. They emphasize high quality, continuous compressions, early use of AEDs, and they only move patients if it's unsafe. They also employ a team-focused, goal-directed resuscitation effort. But what happens when we stop? Then we have an entirely new set of patients or patients. EMS has historically been reluctant to stop CPR on scene. Much of this has been driven by protocol or guilt or just expectations. And EMS is uncomfortable in moving from the role of lifesaver to grief counselor. But what is acute grief? We'll discuss that more in a minute. But what is the treatment? Well, I would argue that it's something we should call acute grief life support. That's my term. You don't hear that anywhere else, but I think it fits in nicely with what we're used to with advanced cardiac life support, pediatric advanced life support, basic trauma life support. Grief is just as real as the acute ST elevation MI or the acute abdominal pain. So why are we uncomfortable with this role? Well, it's understandable. It's hard to find anyone that is comfortable with this role. Most folks in EMS feel inadequate. 
and they feel that others are better trained to handle grief than they are. But you're not alone. The vast majority of nurses and doctors who are polled on this subject report that they've had little, if any, training in how to deal with grief or offer grief support. Why is it important? Survivors report improved outcomes in terms of their grief response and their bereavement and mourning over time. Survivors may weigh the words that you speak to them, in some cases, over a lifetime. But what studies exist demonstrate that the caring attitude of the provider means more to the patient or the or the survivor than actual the station of that provider. Let's talk about a case study. This is a typical case that happens every day in North Carolina. The scenario has a few assumptions though. The assumption is that the patient will not respond to resuscitation efforts. It assumes that this patient is found in an indwelling resident and the scene is safe. It also assumes that it's a non-traumatic natural circumstances surrounding the arrest and it provides a framework for which us to build on, but we also have to remember that circumstances will dictate flexibility. So a 55-year-old man with high blood pressure and diabetes takes a day off from work. He's having lunch with his wife at home when he suddenly says he doesn't feel well, collapses. His wife finds him unresponsive and calls 911. The wife also follows the EMD instructions and starts hands-only CPR. First responders arrive with an AED. They continue the compressions. They find him in a shockable rhythm. They deliver a shock. He is then moved to a non-shockable rhythm. Advanced life support arrives. They continue those compressions, establish an IV, give medications, confirm airway. So what's the next step? When do we approach the surviving spouse's grief reaction? Does it begin if we have return of spontaneous circulation? Does it begin when we transport CPR, if that's what the crew elects to do? Does it begin with termination of the resuscitation? Few situations promote, provoke more anxiety. A great deal of information exists in the police and military realms concerning death notifications, but that information is just that. It's dealing, it's, that information is just that. It's actually notifying a family that a death has occurred at some point in the past. There's little information regarding the developing grief response that occurs during and after a resuscitation. Communication is invaluable, but little attention is paid to this in training programs at all levels. I want to introduce a mnemonic that was developed by Dr. Cherry Hobgood in 2005, formerly of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. The mnemonic is called Grieve Spacing, and it's a nice framework for us to work from. You have to remember that this was developed for young physicians and residents and how to accomplish a death notification. So while there's a good deal of it we can use, it doesn't exactly address our concerns with the unfolding of a resuscitation event and then the ending of that resuscitation event. I'm going to move through the mnemonic quickly and I'm going to talk about it in terms of the pre-hospital environment. G means to gather all the family that's present or all support folks that are there with the family. R for resources. That may be friends, families, clergy, other neighbors that may be available on scene to assist the family. I is for identify. This is one of the most important concepts of this framework. You must introduce yourself, your agency. That person needs to know who you are and what your role is. That immediately tells that family member that you have nothing to hide and that you're going to be upfront and forward with that family member. E for educate. Educate yourself about the situation and the family. Verify for V. Verify the patient has died. That's much more important, I said, in the hospital when we're dealing with death notifications after the fact. Space, give that family personal space as needed. I, inquire, questions, things that you can do for that family. It may be calling family members, it may be calling distant relatives, it may be very small things that you can do for that family that will carry on a big impact. Nuts and bolts, this is typically toward the end of the resuscitation or at the end of the resuscitation where medical legal concerns exist. Whether this is a medical examiner's case and needs to be reported, whether you need to involve your local law enforcement agency dictated by local protocols, and then assisting that family with funeral arrangements, at least the initial arrangements. G, forgive, give contact information. It's important for agencies to develop their own brochures to give family members in this circumstance so that they know who to contact and other support uh, structures that exist in your community for dealing with grief. Let's talk about a timeline of grief treatment. 
Remember, this timeline is when you are talking to the family. It may not be congruent with the timeline of the resuscitation. Time zero, initial contact with the family. This is after the team leader has established that all adequate treatments are indeed in progress. At five to 10 minutes, we should update the family. And you'll notice that in five to 10 minute increments, we should continually update that family through the resuscitation process. Let's talk about time zero. The team leader. The team leader, in conjunction with our focus on team focus CPR or the pit crew approach, the team leader should be established well beforehand. Care of the patient is priority. We need to gather all relevant information. That may come from bystanders, that may come from your dispatcher, that may come from the family member on scene. Ensure that all basic life support and advanced life support measures are being undertaken. Process that information. Take a little time, process that information, try to package it in a way that you can give that information back to the family member. Do a quick assessment. CPRs are pretty routine for us in EMS, but that doesn't mean they're not stress provoking. This situation may uh, draw up some emotions within you about something that may have happened to you or your family in the last few days or the last few years. It's important to acknowledge that, accept it, and then move on. Remove gloves, wipe away sweat, and adjust your uniform. We simply want to present a professional demeanor. I would encourage you to remove gloves though. There's nothing more important in this situation than human touch, and that can be lost while wearing gloves. If possible, have another rescuer present. One of the recommendations that is across the board that this should be done in pairs, just like we do in the hospital. Next, identify the next of kin and yourself. It's important to introduce yourself. Again, identify who you are, your agency, and your role. Shake or touch that patient as the situation dictates appropriate. Assemble the family members in an adjacent room. It's important to try to, to move the family to a room off the area where the resuscitation is taking place, primarily so that they can concentrate on you, you can concentrate on them, and to limit the interruptions. Invite the family to sit down and then ask if you may sit. Remember, you're in their home. Ask if you can sit down with them. If needed, reintroduce yourself to everyone in the room. There may be additional family members that's arrived. There may be neighbors that's arrived. There may be friends. Make sure that the next of kin is comfortable with those folks being in the room with you. Confirm the patient's name and use it. Use it every time you refer to the patient. Sit or kneel with the family member, maintain good eye contact, and try to be at their level. So this position has actually been studied and found to be receptive to survivors. Sit, sit on the front of the seat. Sit lean forward and listen intently, maintaining good eye contact. Your hands can either be clasped in front or resting your forearms on your knees, just as an example. At this point, you should inquire about the events that led up to the resuscitation. Make sure you understand what, what's happened and gather all the appropriate information. Ask about pertinent medical history, medications, allergies, and important to ask about primary care physician. It's important to ask this information at this point because as the resuscitation unfolds, it may become more and more difficult to gather this simple information. Summarize the situation. Use the information that the family has given you as a start. Package that, process it, and then repeat from where the family has left off. Use simple terms, avoid jargon, and remember while, the, while you may understand the gravity of the situation, the family may not realize that their loved one is actually dead. It's important to fire a warning shot. You can introduce that you have some bad news. Circumstances may dictate that you not use that phrase, but you should indicate in some manner that you have bad news for the, for the survivor. Explain the resuscitation, again, in simple terms, avoiding jargon. Just try to explain it to that family the way you would want it explained to you if you were in that situation. Here's an example. You may process the information by saying, I understand that Mr. Smith had taken the day off work, he otherwise felt well, and had a typical day. He was having lunch and then suddenly said he didn't feel well and then collapsed. And I understand that you started CPR after directions from the dispatcher. So at this point, we're not really sure what happened, but Mr. Smith's heart's not beating and he's not breathing. We're doing compressions to pump blood through his chest. We're giving him oxygen, we're giving him drugs, and we're using a defibrillator or giving shocks in order to try to restart start his heart. 
Unfortunately, when someone's heart stops beating or they stop breathing, the chance that they will survive is really low, sometimes less than 5%. I want you to understand that when someone's heart has stopped beating and they've stopped breathing, it means they've died suddenly. It's very important to use the word death, dying, or die. Those are universal terms that are understood by everyone. Let the family know that you're doing everything possible. You may want to say that we are doing everything that's available in the emergency department at this point in your living room. The doctors do not want us to move Mr. Smith because each time we move him, it interrupts our compressions and our therapy and even further decreases his chance of survival. Ensure that the family understands all the information. Answer all the questions openly and honestly. If you don't know the answer, simply say so. Also ensure the family that you'll provide them an update in about five to 10 minutes. Be vigilant, don't promise and not keep. And then excuse yourself to the resuscitation. At this point, you may invite the family to witness the resuscitation. Invite, but do not force them to witness. If this is chosen, then a responder should be assigned to the family, preferably one with more experience and may be better able to answer questions as they uh, appear. The reason we do this is because studies have shown that survivors have improved satisfaction um, in both in terms of their grief and knowing that everything was done for their family members. In hospital literature, this is now a big deal. It's being written about and studied frantically. But in our situation, EMS has done this for over 30 years. We've never had the chance to compartmentalize the family away from the resuscitation because 85% of these resuscitations takes place in the patient's home. Next update, in about five to 10 minutes. Remember, you may be at the 15 to 20 minute or five to 10 minute mark in the resuscitation. Try to assemble the family in the adjacent room. They may wish to stay at the resuscitation, and if they do, that's okay. Just try to move them adjacent to the resuscitation where they can concentrate on you and you can concentrate on them. Invite them to sit down again, but if sitting doesn't permit itself, then stand and continue that good eye contact. It is important to try to get family members to sit down because folks have been known to pass out with information that's being conveyed in this manner. Provide an update on the resuscitation, again, in simple terms, not using jargon. Despite our efforts, Mr. Smith's not responding to the treatments. We are continuing to pump on his chest, give him oxygen, using a defibrillator if you are, and giving drugs in an effort to restart his heart. Update them on the time that's elapsed so far and remind them that for every minute that passes, the chance that he will survive becomes even less. So at the five to 10 minute mark, Again, it's time for an update, and it's time to fire another warning shot. We are continuing our efforts, but once we have reached 30 minutes, if Mr. Smith has not responded, the chance of him surviving is essentially zero. But I want you to understand that we, were, we are continuing all our efforts. Ensure that the family understands the update, answer all the questions openly and honestly, and ensure them that you'll be back with them in five to 10 minutes to update. Be vigilant, don't promise, and not keep. At the 10 to 15 minute update may be better really to try to assemble the family in that adjacent room again. If you can't, that's okay, but you should make more effort to try to get them away from their resuscitation. Again, it's time to provide an update with that simple warning shot. Unfortunately, Mr. Smith is not responding. His heart's not beating and he is not breathing. We have continued chest compressions to pump his heart. We have placed an airway and provided oxygen. We have given numerous drugs and shocked his heart, if you have, and despite all our efforts, he is not responding. At this point, his chance of surviving is very low. It's also good to engage the family in decision-making at this point. Obviously, they've been involved with decision-making from the beginning, but we really should directly engage them at this point. And you can start by saying, have you and Mr. Smith ever talked about what he would want done if in this circumstance. And I emphasize what he would want done if he had succumbed to a cardiac arrest. Ensure the family understands the information, answer all the questions openly and honestly, and then ensure the family will be back with them in an additional five to 10 minutes for an update. And then excuse yourself back to the resuscitation. At the 20 to 30 minute update, try to assemble that family into the adjacent room again. Invite everyone to sit, maintaining good eye contact. 
provide the update in simple terms and avoid any jargon. Despite all our efforts, Mr. Smith is not responding. His heart is not beating and he is not breathing, which means he has died. Our team agrees we have done everything possible to save him, and we have also talked to the doctors who also agree, if you've had that conversation. We all agree it's time to stop the resuscitation. Two basic responses you may gain from the family. They may plead with you to continue. This is up to the team leader. You may respond to that by saying, we will continue for an additional five minutes, but if he does not respond, we must stop because his chance of surviving at this point is, is, is zero. Some family may accept the situation and agree it is time to stop. In fact, some family members may decide to stop much earlier than you've anticipated. And if the situation or circumstances are appropriate, then honor that request. This is a very difficult but important task. Conversations are uncomfortable, but they're necessary. The initial family provider contact has long-standing effects on how they will respond to grief. Bad news given inappropriately or in, in an uncaring manner may have negative psychological effects indefinitely on the survivors. It's very difficult for moving from lifesaver and our technical skills to grief counselor, but it's important. At this point, our resuscitation has stopped. Now what? What is grief? Grief is a reaction to a loss. It's variable, but it includes certain things such as feelings, physical, behavioral, and spiritual responses. Re reactions are variable, but they typically follow a pattern over time. You may, have, you may remember Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and her five stages of death, which are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then acceptance. It's important to remember that this was actually developed um, as a case series from terminal cancer patients. So this actually involves the reaction of the patient themselves to death, but it also certainly involves the survivors as well. Dr. Margaret Epperson added to Dr. Ross's work and added the six stages of acute grief reaction, which probably more fits what we are accustomed to. First stage is high anxiety, and it may be accompanied by nausea, syncope, high-pitched voice, agitation, aggression, things that we are accustomed to seeing at some points. Then denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then something called reconciliation. That's not quite the same thing as acceptance, but reconciliation is when that survivor has been able to process the information and at least come to some terms with it. Common grief responses you may encounter. I don't expect you to remember these. They're simply packaged in a scientific way, but as we talk about them, most of you may have experienced some of these in your work. Holistic grief response. It means the family members kind of gathers as a unit and expresses their grief openly and even allow others to come in, whether related or not. Those folks who have action-oriented grief response, we've seen this before when spouses begin to do housework or tidy things up, but they're doing things in a goal-directed manner. In ordinarily calm grief response, also common. It may seem that the survivor is actually detached from the situation or is ignoring the situation. An important caveat about this is some of those folks who exhibit the most calm behavior are some that typically may end up with having an explosive reaction later. Emotional withdrawal and grief response. The patient may shut, excuse me, the survivor may shut down and become uncommunicative. The extreme guilt um, grief response. This is probably more common in death notifications where someone may have died in a car accident. And an example may be, I should have never let them have the car keys. I should have never let them drive. We may see it in someone who says, I should have made them take their hypertensive medications this morning, or should have made them take their insulin. Situation blaming grief response. And this typically is where the situation is blamed, not the provider, such as his high blood pressure being uncontrolled is what killed him. The caveat to this, though, is once you have seen one grief reaction to sudden death, that's what you've seen, one grief reaction to sudden death. Every reaction is variable. Each person's grief response is individual. You may witness every stage of a grief response, such as the Epperson model, or you may only see one. Anger and aggression are not uncommon, and they should be anticipated. Knowledge of these responses help you avoid misunderstanding and defensive reactions to the survivors. Grief response. What do I do and say? 
appropriate things to say. It, it's okay to say I'm sorry. It's okay to cry. There are certain circumstances that are going to cause you to become overwhelmed with your own emotion, and it simply lets the family know that you care. Demonstrate empathy and sympathy. Silence does not have to be filled. It's okay to respond to family members by silence. Your body language is just as important as a spoken word. Listen. Listen intently. And again, the nonverbal communication is just as important as verbal. Highlight positives. In this situation, Mrs. Smith started CPR and remind her that she gave her spouse the best chance of survival. Acknowledge guilt if it's there and allow the family to lead you through that process. Things to avoid. Your feelings or past experiences with death. While they may be important for you to show empathy and sympathy, the family is probably not equipped at that point to help deal with your own reactions to the situation. Religious discussions. We really need to be highly qualified to engage in religious discussions. They can be highly misconstrued even when from your perspective they may be simple and straightforward. Haste or quick body movements. It sometimes presents an uncaring attitude. Things to avoid. Certain euphemisms. Passed away or passed on. That can be misconstrued by different cultures. We lost them. Going to be with the Lord or expired. And a number of other examples exist. So completing the process, view of the body. We assumed that this case was a non-medical examiner case with natural circumstances. If that is the case, and this is dictated by your local protocols, then viewing of the body is very important. It's important for closure of grief and ongoing bereavement and mourning. The family may not wish to view the body, though, and shouldn't be forced to. But if they do want to view the body, they should be given private time and time with that body as much as they need. Important things for us to do are try to clean up the debris from that resuscitation. Cover the body. You may ask the family if they would like the head covered or uncovered. Move the body to a sofa or a bed. And then slightly elevate the head to prevent color changes. Describe to the family what they may see. If IV lines are still in place, and describe to them the color changes that may happen after death. Law enforcement. Again, this is dictated by local protocol, but in our situation where this is a natural death, law enforcement still may need to be involved, and it's important for you to explain to the family why law enforcement is involved. It's important to replace home items that have been removed. During a resuscitation event, if this took place in the living room, you may have moved lamps, you may have moved couches or sofas. It would be important to put those back into place. Clear the, recine, clear the scene of unnecessary responders. By the time a resuscitation unfolds, many times there are a great many responders at a scene. It's important to have folks there through the completion of this process, but extraneous personnel should be excused and put back in service. Help the family with the initial funeral arrangements, um, if they have any. You may start by contacting the funeral home of their choice and simply stating to the funeral home that you have a patient by the name of that's requesting their services or a family that's requesting their services. Offer to call other family, clergy, neighbors, anyone that can be of support to that family. And then remain to, with the family until the body is removed. So our call has ended. Now what? Well, a routine CPR response can evoke stress. We're asking agencies to do far more. Many agencies are adopting termination of resuscitation on scene, which brings in its own stress. Circumstances causing the provider to relive personal experiences. There may be emotionally charged family or an emotionally charged scene. And there's also provider guilt. Did we do everything we could? Critical incident stress management. There's lots of things that can provoke a critical incident stress, stress management protocol. This is dictated by your local protocol. And even though it may not be a disaster or a building collapse, certainly a CPR can evoke those stressful responses. Critical incident stress management was introduced in the 1980s by Dr. Jeffrey Mitchell. This was a comprehensive integrated program to respond to an overwhelming event. In 2004, critical incident stress debriefing was brought on the scene, and this was a more structured, short duration uh, intervention. Since then, there's been a multitude of critics and problems that have come up with critical incident stress management and debriefing. 
In fact, many studies have shown that folks subjected to critical incident stress debriefing actually did worse than those providers who weren't subjected to the intervention. In 2000, Dr. George Everly refined the critical incident stress management thought and packaged it in these tenets. Mobilize only after a significant event. Implement the most appropriate intervention, and that's based on the provider's need. Not all signs and symptoms indicate an unhealthy reaction. Many of those signs and symptoms of a reaction are quite healthy and expected. Tailor the intervention to the needs of the individual. You can see this is a protocol by the National Association of EMS Physicians. The first caveat is to identify a situation that may be a potential traumatic event. And if indeed the protocol needs to be utilized, then it is evoked. The second is a hot wash or a timeout. And this is reported to be very beneficial by most providers. The timeout consists of, in many cases, the provider being allowed to have 30 to 45 minutes of downtime, either with peers or without, to kind of consolidate their thoughts and to process the, the scene or the event that just occurred. It can also be performed by the supervisor in terms of a hot wash. And that is going over what happened, what was successful, what could have gone better, what can we improve, and who should we tell what we've learned? And that fits into the category of psychological first aid, which you see listed on the right. Then we have a decision to make. Has it been successful? And if so, the protocol is terminated. If it hasn't been successful, then we need further intervention. But sometimes it's undetermined whether it's successful. And then we can move on to trauma screening questions, and you see those listed here. This typically happens days to weeks after the event, and of these 10 questions, greater than six indicate a potential problem. So when providers were screened and asked what they did want, most were universal in saying a brief timeout, consisting of 15 to 45 minutes of downtime just to consolidate their thoughts, simple support from their supervisor or their management, and basically simple interest being shown by the management team. More, de more detailed discussions only if in the days to weeks that the provider actually feels that they're necessary and that they are warranted. So to wrap up, you control incident stress by controlling stressful incidents. EMS is called on to do more with less. Team focused or pit crew CPR, managing cardiac arrest on scene, managing that grief throughout the entire resuscitation pro process and seeing it through to completion. And in that important job of responding to family and survivors in grief. EMS is acutely aware of the problems, but many times fail to recognize the rewards of their job. But is, and in closing, EMS is always able to adapt and respond to any situation.